coal was king in this area. Right. But uh, with all due respects, uh, first aid was our savior. And as I get, got down off the high timbers there to get some, some lagging as they call it, to put in, I walked past the thing, a piece of rock, but about three foot square come down from up there just as I went past that opening. Hit you, would you think you would have been killed? If if it hit on the head, yes. Al, what about the miner's hat? Well the miner hat the miner had to buy his hat. The car would cost around say about fifteen dollars. He's sixteen something like that, you know. And where did they sell them? Right at the colliery? Uh, right at the colliery. Well you had to order them. Oh. You had order from the huts of coal, you know, and they get your size, your head, and all that. Would you have to pay the money right up front, or could you pay on it every oh, week? Oh, no, pay on it every week, no, because you weren't making that much. Right, I know you weren't. No, you weren't making that much. One day I was down in the mine, and uh, my lamp went out, and uh, the light, the generator kicked off, because on the trolley, it short, it kicked off the generator, and it got pitch black. And, and I had to go out, get out of the mines, crawling on my hands and knees, crawling on the rail, till I got outside. When I studied first day, we went to a school over in Childs, that was on the other side. And we put in a lot of hours. And these hours that I put in, what I learned from them was a capillary cut a vein cut, and an artery cut. And then, it, when you break an arm, you have to tell the guy if it has a, a broken arm, you tell him to move his fingers, or move his elbow, or move his hip. And that determines where his pain is. And then right away you get him to the hospital. That's what we were taught in first day. First aid began on October 25, 1899, when 25 German colliery miners met with the borough physician, Dr. Matthew J. Shields, to discuss help for injured co-workers. The group continued meeting regularly to learn the necessary skills, and Dr. Shields later used his experience to develop formal first aid instruction under the American Red Cross. The borough of German holds a rich heritage as the birthplace of first aid and a legacy to the courage of the mine workers who were the backbone of the coal industry in Pennsylvania. Activities in the community over Labor Day weekend 1999 honored the memory of the original first aid team and its work at the German colliery.
better understand the effect King Cole had upon its subjects, local educator Mary Peralt talked with Germans resident miners. I'm Mary Peralt and I'm interviewing um, Rip Callahan, who um, has the distinction of having been our mayor for 23 years. Right. And ha he has done so many things for our town. But one of part of his career was in the mines. And um, we want to ask him about his experience in the mines. I remember when we went sleigh riding, we would use the word sprag. Sprags, yeah. And I never knew, you know, because you'd drag your foot and that slowed your sleigh down. And right. then you told me you were a sprag. Well, I told yeah, what I told you, when I, when I first started in the mines, I was what they called a shack. Now, a shack oh. helped the motor runner, he helped the motor runner, couple the cars up, uncouple them, you'd push cars up into the various chambers, they'd load them and you'd go up to the motor and take them, and you'd, the shack would get off and hook them up. Uh, I have a story to tell you about that too. Most miners and laborers uh, would go in and have a couple of drinks before they, they went to work. And tell them where they went. We're going over They went next. to work over in a place, Butler McDermott's <laughs> over a, right on the corner. It stands there to this day. In fact, years and years ago, uh, on a Sunday, they'd had a sign, closed, but go around the back. <laughs> uh. Now, I know that sounds kind of foolish, but that's the way it was because... Uh, but what I was going to tell you about the cars in the shack, uh, I had a motor runner, his name was Billy Yurta. And Billy had a, tipped a few, I guess, that morning. Well, anyhow, we went up in this one area, this chamber, the 76 gangway, and it was quite long, and it was quite steep. And he said uh, he was in a hurry to get out. He wanted to get out. See, the quicker we got done, the quicker we got out. So he was in a hurry to get out, and he said, uh, there's ten loaders up there, Rip. Okay, so I went up and I shackled them up. And he said, uh, I started to put, we in the back car, we would put a rail to the wheels. And on the cars three or four down, we'd put sprags in. Yeah, mine sprags. They were, oh, probably six, eight inches in diameter, tapered on both ends so you could get them in the wheels. And uh, I put four sprags in, and he said, never mind the rail, never mind. Billy, I said, it's not going to hold it. He, he said, it'll hold, it'll hold. I said, okay, you're the boss. So we started down. And how many At cars did you have? Ten. Ten loaded. <gasps> and I thought, oh, I thought, boy, we're going awful fast here. So <laughs> I was down between the motor and the car, and I peeked up. And Billy wasn't there. He jumped, he bailed off. He, was, he probably heard the, and I couldn't hear it because I was down low at the clacking, you know, right. the rate. And I couldn't hear it. He probably heard it. And he bailed off. And when I seen, when I seen him gone, I thought, oh. So the first opening I seen, the first, you know, first chamber was there. Whew, off I went. <laughs> well, no motor, nothing. He took down, he must have took down. Ten props, rails, tip oh. the cars, oh, what a mess, you know. <laughs> electric wire, electric wire, he took that down, I was jumping and sparking. What a, what a mess. But there was no big deal about it. There, he didn't get fired. No, no. Uh, we kept a choir. We wouldn't, we wouldn't let, you know. With certain camaraderie you had between one and another, all the miners didn't. Uh, it's just like, as John and I were saying this morning up there, uh, when we were drilling to fire, make coal, we'd, that's what we called it, making coal. We'd drill, and for the night shift coming in, before we left, we'd load up. But we'd drill the holes and fire them before we left. So the next shift that come in, would have a lot of coal down, and they could load. And they used to do the same thing for the other shift. And it was, uh, you helped one another, because... Uh, you really wasn't getting that much. Oh, the pay was, when I think about it now. Hey, Tom Wilson, that was Art Wilson's father. He was, a, he was our section foreman. He said, I want you to go up there on consideration work. I didn't even know what consideration work was. 
He said, I said, what do I do? Well, he said, you go along all the tracks and clean up the coal and clean up along the tracks and load up and I want two cars to coal. I said, me? Two cars for, yes, he said. Well, I had a load two cars of coal, you know. And I forget it was what we got, was something like six or seven dollars. I think it was seven dollars or something for consideration work, uh. you know. <laughs> you know, a uh, big deal, seven dollars a day, you know. And factories, there were no industry at all, just the mines. And you know what? The Hudson Coal kept everybody out. They kept factories. They kept factories out because I know there were at various times they were they wanted to locate up in this area, but uh, somehow or other it never materialized. It. Of course, that's that's not uh, either here nor there. They didn't want to lose the workers. That's a right. story right there. And I'm not. Go ahead. Uh, Ripti, you know, I'm going to ask you to point out the different parts of the mine. We can't see them. Yeah. But from here, you can tell us where the different um, buildings were, right. the different functions. Right, exactly. Well, to my right, uh, the fan house they had, it was huge fans in there, and that's where they pumped the, pushed the air back down to the mine. In fact, uh, it's covered up now. You couldn't get in it. But the shaft way is still in existence there. Oh my goodness! It's concreted, uh, but it's it's closed in. They can, there's no harm. There's no safety uh, factor involved. And uh, back to my left, a little more was the colliery. That was the blacksmith shop, the car shop where they uh, repaired uh, the mine cars. In fact, they done everything there. They uh, sharpened your your bits, your drills. Uh, it was just about it. They'd done everything there. And to my rear, the right rear, was the mule barn. Uh, there were still mules there when I was a, when I was a young man, although they didn't have them in the mines when I was there. They had the electric motors, but at, they still had mules there when Why I was there. Why did they have them there, I wonder? Well, they were still at use. Oh, they're, they're still at use now. I, it's, it's no secret. I, uh, that was about 1924, 25. Uh, they still had the mules there. Yeah, in fact, uh, a house next door to me, Johnny McCluskey, he was the mine boss, oh. uh, the mule barn boss, I, may, I meant to say, the mule barn boss. And uh, yeah, there, at that time, even then, there was probably 30, 40 mules there. And I don't know what ever happened to them, but uh, it, it was something when everybody used to, the guys, especially the boys, would sneak down there and get on the mules and get right, you know, <laughs> the usual thing would that a boy would do. Up? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Some of them were real rough. They'd kick and throw you off and bite. Oh, they'd bite at you. Uh, amazing, I said, how, how people will complain about the slightest thing anymore. Here was the railroad. Ran here. Now, they didn't have diesels. This was the steam engines. And they would start blowing at the crossing here. There was a, naturally the here, it was the crossing. They would start blowing and they'd blow continuously up to maybe three, four hundred yards up. And I mean, they really blew. You could shake the house with it. And then on the top was the O&W railroad. Uh, I never knew the O&W was huh? there. Oh yeah, the oh. O&W, you can see the bridge. Every so often the cows would get on the track and get hit with the train, get hit with the train. Oh, then there was a big commotion over in the east side, you know, over in the east side because of Volantis to one of them people. But everybody had cows. In fact, I was thinking about that the other day. Everybody in the morning had had cows on the east side, used to bring them over here, and they turned them loose down in this, we used to call it the pasture. I think it was maybe a dollar a month or something that they'd, they'd pay. Because <laughs> remember, those were depression days, right, you know, it was right. kind of tight. But they turn them loose down there, and then at night they'd come back and get them. There's, there's so much history there, and I, I, I'm getting at the stage now where I sit and I think about these things. Right. Okay, Ricky, okay. what do you think about this, this celebration we're working on now? It is the most tremendous thing that I've ever heard of. It, it certainly was... Uh, I, have, I have a little thought about this thing. Coal was king in this area. Right. But uh, with all due respects, uh, first aid was our savior. There is no question about that whatsoever. When there was nothing, it's 
forced you to go to these first aid classes, but everybody knew it was for their benefit and their good, and they went voluntarily, and you, they went faithfully. It wasn't right. a case of anybody making you go. Uh, and it did save lives. Oh, there is no question about it. Uh, I related, I think, <laughs> to you, Mary, a, a story about a first aid down there, about one of the men, they, and I've seen this, got hurt terrible bad. He got crushed with the mine cars. His pelvis was broke, his legs were broke, and uh, Chester Jashansky was the first aid man. And they were located not too far from us, and of course they heard us hollering and yelling, and he ran down, and uh, we helped them to get him. But Chester performed the first aid, and probably saved the man's life, because he was bleeding like a uh, unbelievable. Uh, coal companies didn't go all out, even to provide first aid equipment. Right. I know lots of times the men brought stuff in themselves, bandages, right. and that, that they would bring. They had, over at the breaker over there, they had a huge air whistle. And uh, if there was work tomorrow, they'd blow this whistle. Woo! One day, one blast meant work. If it blew twice, there was no work. That's the way we knew whether there was going to be work tomorrow or not. Here, there was a billboard here, and us kids used to climb up on the top of it. The strike was on, and was, this was loaded with women. There was probably a hundred women here. And Gus McGann's car was coming over. They tipped his car over. Oh, my God. The women did. They tipped the car over. The state police were here with the horses and the big, long nightsticks, you know. <gasps> oh, hey, we loved it, you know. <laughs> we, it was we, exciting. We, yeah, yeah. There's no doubt that first aid saved a lot of lives. Lots of them. And well, I thank God for them. Right. Yeah. Well, Rick, yeah. it was so nice talking to My you. My pleasure. My pleasure. And I will see you at all the festivities right. this weekend. I we, hope. You know, I said, the fact is, we are history. You know? You I think I explained exactly who the Esgro brothers are, but the Esgros have lived in town many, many years. There were many brothers, and they're all the sons of Dominic Esgro. They lived on Main Street, and they're very famous for the house they lived in, Dulce Donum, mm -hmm. and uh, that means happy home. And that is still on your home, isn't it, John? Dulce yes. Donum. Mm -hmm. And anybody who went through German would see that and say, I wonder what that means. But if you took Latin, minor, I guess that's all he did. He mined all his life. Dominic he was, a minor, mm -hmm. he was an electrician. He did, did it all. He did his own. But he he wanted to be his own boss, that's, and that's why that's he why went, went into the these mines. mines. Mm -hmm. And it was a big undertaking to start your own mine. Oh, yeah. Um, your father's mine was quite different from the other mines around here. Would you like to tell me about that, John? Yes, it was a, a small operation. And uh, like your larger mines, that uh, they had the shafts that, you know, they all went down. And what we had was a, was a slope in the heading we went in. And there was only about, well, when I worked, there was only about eight of us when I worked. John, there was more when John worked. And uh, out the, when we went down in the headings, then we went off into what they call chambers. 
And, and what I did is I, I ran the, the main road. And, and that was the main... That's the main, main road. Right. And then the where chambers the, went off. Where the cars came down in. Right. And I used to get the trolley motor and I would distribute the cars to the different chambers. After I distributed the cars, then I would run the mechanical loader, which was uh, had a scoop like a triangle and it had ropes. It had a main rope and a tail rope. And you would send it all the way up into the chamber and would send a, a jack back up in there with the tail rope on it. And uh, the miner or the laborer would kick the scoop into the pile of coal that we fired. He'd kick it with his foot and he would give me the signal with the lights or the buzzer. And two buzzers and I'd, I'd start the scoop coming down and it would fill up. I'd pull it down and there was a chute, an apron that would come up and the coal would fall in the car. And I would send it back and that's the way we loaded the, the cars. And it was, a, like I said, it was a small operation. It wasn't very big when I was there. Would you like to tell us some of your experiences? Yeah, I'll tell you, I'll beginning at the beginning. Well, I was going to school and I was going to ninth grade and my father said to me, you have to get a job. It was hard. My mother and brother got killed in an accident and had hardship. I mean, I had to get a job. But like I said, I wish I could have graduated. I right. could allow young people to graduate, get an ed education. But I started working in Scranton, down in the, Cas the Scranton Casca Company. Well, in six months I worked there. It got tough and I had to hitchhike home every night. You know, in the winter, so I, later I got a job over here in Germany from uh, Butler uh, Stragline. There was a uh, surface stripping, sur surface mining, stripping. Did you explain to us what strip mining means? Yeah, it's a drag line with a big bucket on it. They take the dirt off the coal. But they start at the top. Yeah. They don't go underneath. They, they drag all the dirt off the coal and the coal is exposed. Right. That's strip mining. And uh, we stripped here on the White Avenue. And that's right in back here. Yeah, it's right back here. And that was all stripping there. We stripped right. there. Then we over to the baseball field, German Blue League baseball right. field. We stripped that in the uh, old cemetery, it's called the old cemetery up I there. I remember the old cemetery. Where the projects is up there now. I worked up there. Was there much coal up there? Well, there was quite a bit of coal. Where and what company did you work for then? That was uh, first for Butler, then Moran, and then Drake. And then, then after that, they, when they finished stripping, there was no more work sites. So I, I went to work for my dad up there. He started the mines. That was for DeAngelo's Coal Company. Did you lease them land from him, yeah, from DeAngelis? Yeah, they just didn't have the mines there, and uh, I worked there about oh, 10 years. You have your mining papers? Yeah. I'd have three, four laborers under me a lot of mm -hmm. times. Like I said, Lone Co. had a load, maybe two cars a man. We had four, four of us there, we had about eight cars. So my job was propping up and making it safe for the men working. I drill the holes, charge them, and set them off. Right. I mean, it was a tough job, though, 18 inches or 28 inches. Sometimes when it was low 18 inches, we had a blow bottom rock up to make it so you could From, And you mean like the floor? It would be yeah. like the what you were walking on, to blow that rock? Crawling. Uh. So we'd have to blow it up to make room to get in there. So we had like, people want us down, we had jalopies. That's a conveyor. It brings the coal out a lot of times. <coughs> And a shaker shoot, the shaker shoot is another machine that shakes the coal out. But the brother Joe said about a mechanical order to the scoop that pulls the coal out. Right. So my job was to prop up, timber up, make sure everything is safe in there. And I usually do all the drilling and charging the holes up. John, uh, explain to us about how the mines were inspected or how your mine was inspected. Well, we have a mine foreman come in every day, inspect the chambers where we're at. Well, the chambers and the headings and inspect out like for if there's gas in there, black damp or anything like that. He inspect that out, he inspects it and then he'd go out then we'd start working. Every day he'd come in. Then we have uh, state inspectors coming in. Then you have federal inspectors every couple of months come in. So Check. you really uh, it was really um, scrutinized. The yeah. mine was really under surveillance yeah. that you know that uh, for you for the safety of you men. Absolutely. Definitely. Johnny, why don't you explain the, the headings, what, what you mean by that? The heading is, uh, the coal is only 2 foot 18 inches, so we'd have to get the tracks in there. We'd have to blow up about 5 foot of rock to make it 6 foot 6 high. And uh, we'd blow the rock up and we laid tracks and keep going in. And uh, we have to timber as we're going where bad wolf is, timber. Right. And uh, 
And as we get, we get in there about 100 feet, and every 50 foot we run off chambers. We have two foot of coal, we have loaders, or shaker shoots, or jalopy set up. And what there. was the chamber? Chamber is about, the coal is about 18 inches, two foot high, then we drive so was up. Was the chamber like a room? No, no. no like that, a little? that was on top of the rock. Yeah. Oh, I thought a chamber and was the, like a little room. After you take the four foot of rock, then the coal would go from there to the roof. Oh. You would crawl up on top of that, and you would run uh, well, I'd say, what was it, what was it uh, the width of it, about 30 feet, 20 30 feet? 30 feet, 25 to 30 feet. They would be wide, and then you would follow that all the way up. That you run the vein up, and, 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 and so far you'd run it. And then every 50 foot would have to have a cross get coming over for, for airways. Right. So you have two chambers going up parallel the same way, and you run cross for, for airways. Well, let me just ask you this question. How did you get the air in there? Because I know the Hudson Coal had big fans. Sometimes we'd have fans set up. So you had huge fans or just yeah. ordinary little no, fans? No, huge fans. Regular fans for it. You had to, I guess. Yeah. How, how big was that one up here in, by the pothole? That was huge. Remember that big, yeah. big one on the outside? That was a big fan. And then I remember that mine up there. I never knew you people owned it, but I remember yeah. it on the highway there. You would you would freeze if you stood there with the air, the way it was coming around you. Yeah, I didn't work in that way. That's the one I That was the last mm -hmm. one he left. But, uh, <clears throat> see, we go up there like the airways, see, and if they all work, because the old minings, there's old minings, we bust in there and we have a lot of air then, so you wouldn't have to worry about that. Right. But like I said, that was dangerous work. Like I, like I tell a lot of guys, we had a chamber, like up there 300 feet, and we, on a Friday, we went home, next, uh, Monday we came in, it was down tight right to the main road, the oh. rock caved everything, we lost all the tools and everything. Oh, goodness. And like I said, that was the number one Dunmore vein. See, that was bad with the soap right. stone. Right. And uh, that cave right down. And you could cave. have been right under the cave in. <laughs> and yeah. and you would come in at Wood Cave over the weekend, and then you would arrive, and then... If we went in there in the cave, then we'd, be, oh. we'd have the course. Right. But like I said, it was wet. And the black damp is, if you get up there, there's no air like the air. Too far up, and there's no air, you get black damp. That's bad air. Right. Then if you had the safety lamp there, you see the lamp go out, the light go out, then you know. And would you, would black damp, would that affect you that you would just fall asleep? Yeah. yeah. And if you didn't get out of there or get, didn't get fresh air, you'd, you'd be dead? Out, you'd die. Right. But like I said, the light gets going low, then you get out. You have right. to watch it. Like if there was gas in there, we never had no gas though, but the light would start light, by, light brighter, higher, you know, and you know it's gas. But right. Well, that was tough work. I advise nobody to go in the mines. <laughs> And uh, we always had to have a second opening, too. Yeah, second opening. You had to right. have one. That was a lot. Joe, what is the strangest thing that ever happened to you in the mines? Well, when I, one day I was down in the mine and uh, my lamp went out. And uh, the light, the generator kicked off, because on a trolley, it short, it kicked off the generator and it got pitch black. And, and I had to go out, get out of the mines, crawling on my hands and knees, holding on the rail until I got outside. And, and it was about uh, maybe three, four hundred feet. Maybe more. And so you just had to feel. So I had to feel way. the rail to get outside, uh, and that was the. That's how I got out, by just grabbing the rail and crawling on my hands and knees. I know when I interviewed Harry uh, for the paper, he said there is nothing like the black of the mine. Nope, and that was There's it. There's no that was, blackness like that. Nope, that was the strangest thing that happened to me, and it was it was funny. It was, it was funny and scary, but I crawled all the way out and then. You just and kept your wits about you and yeah. said, oh, "I yeah. had to get. I have to get out of here." And that, that, that was it. Mary, can I say one more thing? Yes. No, I went to night school, so everybody knows. I went to Don <laughs> John, Pet. I think that's wonderful. Scranton and Pet. you have your mining certificate? Yeah, see, when I was in the mines, I went to Scranton Tech for night school for Right, after working all day in the mines, yeah. you went to school? Three nights a week. Oh. Uh, well, I had to, get out to go to get an education to get out of the mines. Right. You know, well, that's a, that's a credit to you, John, yeah. to do that after, because I know how hard you worked. And I know times, I remember those times. Things were really rough in those days. Yeah. And I graduated and I went in the mines. <laughs> right. That was the only job right. at the time was available. Well, it's been wonderful talking to you too. And I talked to Harry. Um,
Harry, um, you mined at quite a different kind of mine than the Hudson Coal Company. Could you describe the kind of mine that you worked in? And could you describe to us what you had to do every day? Well, As you're proceeding through, in through the tunnel, whatever you're... Yeah, in the mine shaft. But we, so we, every day, what did you have to do? We used to wear knee pads. And uh, 16 inches, when you're crawling in that, it's, it's very, very low. So the coal was only 16 inches from the ground. Right. Which means that you had to go in practically crawling in. Right, we had to, to crawl mine in there this coal. and lay on, lay on our stomachs or our back and go right in there. And you'd have to put them holes maybe, oh, I don't know, about two feet apart along the waist, 15 in it, go to coal. And then would you have to lay the tracks in go as you went in? Mm -hmm. See, we'd have to put the, the, the ties, they call it, the, the wood. Right. And we'd run the tracks in there. And uh, we'd have like a, a, a vein of coal, about 16 inches long. We'd take it, take it out and blow the coal out. And it'd be like a chamber about, oh, I don't know how, how many feet apart. I don't even remember that. But uh, it'd be one uh, <coughs> section maybe about 20 feet down we'd have another then 20 more feet it'd be another van you know we'd go in like that and who did the dynamiting in your mine well, we used to have to drill the holes and dynamite just the miner how late. old were you when you started up in your father's mine Ooh, i'd say about 16 16 years old and i i worked off and on with it but then i worked in uh, down in Moffitt's, I told you, down there near Wilkes Bear, right. Moffitt's, and then. Uh, so you traveled all the way to Wilkes Bear to work in the yeah, mines? Yeah, the, the DNH, it's DNH down there, and then Moffitt's and Dixon, and then uh, this here, what the Roger Brothers, where they, they had a mines there, mm -hmm. I worked in there for a while. But this, this was uh, years ago. Harry, were you ever hurt in the mines? No. The, the, the one time was. Like uh, we were drilling holes, and we'd have to crawl in there. And I lifted a jackhammer up, and I heard it in my back on the lower lower part of my back going in with the with the jackhammer they call it. And I don't know. It was must look like it weighed about 50 pounds or more. I don't know. And then we'd have a long drill and drill through there. Right. But uh, that's all that happened. Well, you were very lucky. Ooh. Harry, did you have any first aid boxes in yeah. the mines? We had them outside, and they'd, they'd cut, we call it a shifting shanty. 
and uh, we had everything out there. So well, that's good that you had uh, those uh, methods that would take care of you, you know, in case something happened. Right. One time we uh, fired all the holes in there. We usually go about 15, 16 holes. One morning we went up, it was all come down on us. No call, nothing there. And this it came, fell on you? It, no, it didn't fall on me. I wouldn't be here now talking <laughs> to you if it did. How many how many years would you say that your father worked in the mines? Oh, about 50, 60. A long, long time. He had the Spring Hill Coal Company, the breaker in the lane here. Right. And then he had the mines. And then we went up to the, the Whipper Willie, they used to call it. He was, was that up higher, the Whipper Will? Way up high. Well, I think it's remarkable that you plowed up to Aylesworth and up to Hosey Dam to go to work every day. Mm. That was really something. In, in those days, there wasn't, uh, you couldn't go out and get jobs any place at all. It's like around here now. There, there are not many places. Right. You know? So you had to work in the mine. If you wanted to work, you had to work. Right. Anybody around here had to go into the mines. Right. Well, Harry, it was wonderful talking to you. Yeah. John, I'd like to ask you some questions. Yes. Uh, how many years did you work in the Hudson Coal Company? Twenty-two. And what was your job in the Hudson Coal Company? Well, I sighted many places from labor up, kept moving up to become the, the engineer on that thing. And what opening did you work out of in Germany? No. Number six slope. Approximately how many worked men worked in there? Oh, well, they must have been about four or five hundred men working down there. Down in number six. Number six. Did you? It, uh, it was all a mechanical mining there. Right. Um, how far down were you in the ground? Down here, it was about oh maybe two three hundred feet deep. Uh, when did you go into the service? In uh, late, late in forty four, nineteen forty four. And then, when you came out of the service, you went back. I come back and I looked around. There's nothing around. The only thing that was left is mining. So I went to, down to Marvin, and that's where I stayed there till fifty five. So you were at the Marvin about ten years then. About eight, eight, I think eight. And what was your job down at the Marvin? I was I was a miner. Yeah, my mining papers I had, so I, I wound up mining and drove the headings or gangways, as I'd call it. Could you explain that to us? Well, heading is a there's no road going in. It's like a tunnel, putting a tunnel in that you could go in there, walk in, and. Uh, Sent after you drove in so far, three, four hundred feet in, you know, people would come in, take chambers off of that to pull coal and shaker shoots out of there. And what exactly did you do in the chamber? Well, the chamber would be in other miners, the three or four handed dude. But they, were you, were you I'll, blasting or were you uh, driving the. Uh, I was out, out right driving gangway. 
gangway. I don't know, drilling and blasting ourselves. Uh, and you got your mining certificate in 1937, correct? Right, right. Where did you take that course to get your mining certificate? Well, they, uh, they questioned you on explosive, use of explosive and roof testing of things. Um, Down the Marvin, all the different was from what we had here was you had a uh, safety lamp because of gas or black lamp. Here in, in this line of German mines, you didn't have to have, you had open lights. That's our closed light section in Marvin. Right, and so German had the advantage of not having any black damp. Well, you didn't have to no, worry about that no, too much? No, in Germany you didn't have to worry about gas or black damp. Right. What's the difference between gas and black damp? Well, gas is the one that's explosive. If you walk and light up a cigarette or something, it'll go out. Black damp is the one, if you sit down somewhere, they feel nice and easy, easy first thing you do. You just doze off and you'll finish up. It's lack of oxygen in it. It relaxes you, just like a like a sleeping potion. John, um, what was your opinion of the Hudson Coal? Do you think it was a fair company? It was. It was. Um, uh, from my experience working in it, it was. Can't complain on the other ones. I didn't work with them. Did you like working in the mines? Well, only place you made any money, not big money, but at least you made more than what did outside, just like I told you before. Uh, could you tell us about the um, experience you had when you almost um, oh, were that's, injured? That's in a 14 foot, we're putting up timbers to support the roof, and then you had to build cards on top of them. Uh, and as it got down off the high timbers there to get some some lagging as they call it to put in, I walked past the thing, a piece of rock, about, about three foot square come down from up there just as I went past that opening. You were very lucky that yeah, it didn't that, hit that you. That was the closest I ever was to anything outside of the water that we had in our German mines and have up our necks. Would, if that had hit you, would you think you would have been killed? If, if it hit on the head, yes. Yes, it was a big piece. It was about, oh, about two foot thick. It was about three foot square. And John, uh, one other thing, if you could tell us about when we're on Jefferson Avenue right now. Right. And if you could tell us how the Hudson Coal mined under Jefferson Avenue. Well, they're robbing pillars. They're robbing uh, pillars of pieces that's left behind as a support. And, and what's the pillar the, made of? And they take out the pillars, the mine's rock starts getting heavy out and breaking down and caving up. And did they take the pillars? They took the coal? Well, they take whatever they can because uh, when uh, the weight starts coming, squeezing something is terrible, you have to get out of there because it comes in. When it comes in, it comes like a storm when the rocks break. And then what happened on Jefferson Avenue to the houses? Well, this one, you've seen this one. This went down eight foot. From Your one house other. here? Yes, they had five steps in front. And, but they had the, the Hudson Coal for, for the high beams underneath that held it as level as they could as it caved. The yard was about, uh, about nine feet down below the original water level they had here. The water used to go out of the yard and now it comes in there. I have the biggest pool in town. John, it's been very nice speaking to you and learning about your experiences in the mine. And I'm so glad that we have you on tape. And we will always have this. We will have you being interviewed about your life in the mines right. in German. And thank you so much.
<laughs> this is a momentous day for the borough of German. And I would be remiss if I did not extend thanks to the mayor, the members of his committee, for all the work involved in doing it. And now we would like to begin our ceremonies by Reverend Alan Rupert, pastor of the Primitive Methodist Church. Our Father, what a great day to be a part of this community. To gather together here in this yard, under these beautiful blue skies and surrounded by these rolling green mountains. Lord, you've given us a home here, a place where love is, a place where we have a tradition. It's been passed on to us, a tradition of caring and compassion. And our Father, we would gather together today to celebrate that. For a hundred years ago, our fathers gathered to make provision for those that had fallen among them, to lift them up and to bring healing. Our Heavenly Father, under the banner of first aid, the spirit of caring and compassion that started here in this community has gone all over the world. Lives have been saved. Limbs have been spared. Homes and families saved and restored. The world's a better place. And you have allowed our community to be a part of it. The National Anthem. pleasure I present to you Mr. Leo Moskowitz, your honorary chairman. Step back just a moment. In October of 1899, Dr. Matthew Shield volunteered to instruct a group of about 24 miners from the German colliery of the Hudson Coal Company in the treatment of injured workers at the scene of the accident. This monument was called the First Aid Association, this movement rather, was called the First Aid Association of German, and first aid stations were built in the mines and contained such medical supplies as were available at the time, such as bandages, splints, iodine, and so forth. This group of volunteers were taught first aid in a building called Edmonds Hall, which was located next to the Windsor Hotel on Washington Avenue in Germany. In 1943, which was 44 years later, at a meeting of the German Borough Council, consisting of six members, John Ruchenick, Harry McCluskey, Robert Allen, Leroy Bennett, Dawson Langman, and myself, it was unanimously voted and signed by Floyd Battenberg Burgess that, the recog that recognition should be given to Dr. Shields, founder of the movement and his group of dedicated men. It was decided that a monument be erected in their honor and placed in a prominent position at the German Community Center located on Washington Avenue. It remained there until the building and lot was sold and then the monument was moved to its present location. Formal first date under the American Red Cross began in 1949, which was 50 years from the founding of first aid, and Red Cross publications contains references to Dr. Shields and first aid. Today, we rededicate this monument to Dr. Matthew Shields, the great humanitarian, and his group of 24 men who founded first aid in America at the German colliery of the Hudson Coal Company in October 25, 1899. Thank you.
Now, reading the names of the original first aid class, Matthew Shields, M.D., Samuel Waters, David Jenkins, John Hogarth, and George Pendered, Sr., Thomas Harvey, William Whitley, Edward Stewart, Andrew Richards, William Westington, Sr., William Mello, Fred Daw, James O'Dowd, Harry Langman, William Roberts, Peter Kelly, Joel Markham, Thomas Williams, Michael Roberts, William J. Taman, Joseph Beckwith, Samuel Laundry, Stephen Markham, John Cooley, William Tennis, and an unknown. Our next order of business, and we are fortunate in having the granddaughters of Mr. Peter Kelly here. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Miss Mary Peral and Miss Dorothy Matthijs. Thank you very much. A memorial prayer given by Reverend Sharon Corsarello, pastor of the First United Methodist Church. Our Father, we come this day to celebrate and to remember. Father, as we begin a new millennium, we remember these men who so valiantly served, not thinking of themselves, but thinking of those whose lives were entrusted to their hands. We give you praise for those men today because we know the sacrifice that it must have cost them. Father, we ask your blessing on their families as they remember. And we ask your blessing on this community as we go forward. A benediction by the Reverend Joseph Kantz, pastor of the Calvary Community Baptist Church. Reverend, let's pray. Our Holy Father in heaven, we give thanks to you, who in your almighty wisdom and your infinite understanding, you graced us with the privilege of living in this community where important things in history have happened. Most of us have been touched by the legacy that is left by Dr. Shields and the inauguration of first aid Either we've been the recipients of someone else administering first aid to us, or we've been involved in administering it to others. And for these advances in caring and compassion, help in an emergency, we give you thanks. And we also want to remember that you, our God, are a God of, that is in the rescuing business also. That you sent your son Jesus Christ to us not to heal our broken bones and our scratches, but to heal the sickness of our hearts. One remark I would like to make. We as miners are hopeful that what we have put up with and endured and suffered with, that some of our younger generation would realize just how difficult we had to make a living. Paul may have been king, but first aid was our savior. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes. I'm interviewing you today yes. for our centennial. Yes. Everybody, this is Al Shoshansky, okay. and I'm Mary Peralt on the Centennial Committee. Right. And um, Al has led a very interesting life. And right. He has been a miner all his life. Right. And um, Al, how many were in your family? In my family, there's thirteen. 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 And how there many were, boys? Uh, well, eleven boys and two girls. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, Anna and Mary. Right. I remember them. Uh, yeah. I remember both of them. Yeah. And uh, your father came from Poland. Your father came from Poland, right. And he built this house. And built this house. And you're living here at the homestead right, right. now. Right. Born and raised in the old homestead. Right. <laughs> and um, how many sons went to work with your father every day at one point in your life? Well, I'll say about five. Five of you Five marched percent. off with your father. Right. And what mine did you work in? Well, number six mines. Well, uh, down here at the powder mill. Right. How about telling us uh, what the difference between a miner and a laborer? Well, a miner was to take care of the, his labor. In other words, he hired a man and he was a laborer. In other words, he had a load of coal. Right. He had to drill the coal, drill the hole. For the mines, you know. This was the miner. And yeah, that was no, that was the labor, and the miner just had to watch them. You know what I'm saying that everything was going good. I see. So that's what happened. But did the laborer ever put the dynamite in? Yes, yeah, he helped to put the dynamite in the black powder. If the but, but was that up to the miner whether he let him put in the right? That powder was up there. That, that, that was up to the miner. Right, and he had to trust him. That's right, and then he was promoted by that. The labor was promoted. By, by his miner, that he could go mine coal already, you know? Uh huh. With the huts of coal. Right. So that's what happened there. Yes. Is that where the cow Yeah, that was a pasture right there. there. Yeah. That was a pasture. Right. I remember that. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yes. yes. Stichurus would yeah, come right. down here every day, and right. I would come with them. Right, right. To their grandmother. And right. they had a little tin quart. Uh, of course. And they would have the milk, and we would take the milk back up that, for them to that's use. That's right. And they called their grandmother Baba. Was Baba, it? yeah. Pacha, or yeah, no, Baba. Baba. Yeah, oh, yeah, Baba. And I remember your mother. Yeah. You know, she was yeah. a wonderful person. We would come down here every yeah. day. Yeah. And your mom uh, kept, did she have chickens too? We had chickens, yes. Everybody had chickens at that time. We had it for, for uh, right. eggs. And uh, she had a big garden too? Yeah, we had a big garden, vegetable garden, yes. Beets, lettuce, carrots. And did she can a uh, we lot can, of the stuff? Yeah, all, most of it was all canned. You had to can them, yeah. Did you pick berries? Yeah, well, you had to pick berries, yes, and, <laughs> and sell them to be clever with you. What kind of berries did you pick? Huckleberries. That uh, helped out with the family. For pardon? You to, that helped out with the family. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So well, how you many? had to sell them up and you used to get a nickel a quart. Take them uh, up down and sell them. A nickel a quart. How many customers did your mother have for the milk route? Oh, let's see, Jenkins's, Thomas's, up on Gibson Street. Uh-huh. Uh, uh jo Jolly's. They lived in Woodward's house there. Right. And, uh, of course, they went back to Canada. A girl took sick and she went back to Canada. And then we had, uh, well, Jenkins's. We had Jenkins's, too. Dave so Jenkins, right? Dave and Jenkins, yeah. He was the superintendent of the outside. Uh, uh, yeah, of the, the Polly Breaker, yes. Right. Yeah. He was kind of uh, important yeah. over yeah. there. Yeah, oh, he? yeah, he was important, yeah. He came home from England. Blacksmith right. shop was where the colliery is. Right, right. And what did they do with the blacksmith shop? Well, the blacksmith shop, they had to show the mules, put the, uh, the, show, the horse, the mule shoes on them, you know? Right. So, in the case that they went across the river or something, or in the mine, so they won't break their ankle or something. Did did the mules of the Hudson Coal Company were they underground all the time, no. or did they come up? No, no, they they're all they're all the time. They they come out. No, they come out. Don't did they come out every not. day? Every day, every day. Yes, and it was right over here, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, right, right, yeah. About how many mules did they have? Oh, they had high as maybe seventy mules. Oh my goodness. Yes, they had seventy mules, and they had, uh, had what they call the blacksmith used to shoot them, put the. Uh, the steel skews on them. Right, you know? right. 
And he would sharpen all your tools. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. But the miner had to pay for that. I was just going to ask you that. Uh, yeah, the miner... Did the, you have to pay uh, for no, that? No, no, the miner had to pay. It used to be 35, uh, 35 cents a month. What about the dynamite and everything? Did well, they... The, no, the, the, the company furnished that. Oh, that was... Yeah, that's right. They had to furnish the dynamite and the black powder. They had black powder that right. time. And the miner used to get... Well, if they saved the, the keg, the black... Uh, powder. Uh -huh. Well, the miner got 35 cents for each can. Each, uh, each was thing. it a wooden keg or was no, it a no, metal keg? No, no, tin, 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 tin. Al, what about the miner's hat? Well, the miner had, the miner had to buy his hat. It kind of would cost around, say, about $15. See, 16 something like that, you know. And where did they sell them? Right at the colliery? Uh, right at the colliery. Well, you had to order them. Oh. You had to order them from the Hudson Coal, you know, and they'd get your size, your head, and all that. Would you have to pay the money right up front, or could you pay on it every oh, week? Oh, no, pay on it every week, no, because you weren't making that much. Right, I know you weren't. No, they weren't making that much. They're taking out maybe $2 every pay. Tell us when you started in the mines. Well, when I finished high school. I finished high school in 36, so I went in the mines then. But what did your father say to all you boys? Well, they couldn't say nothing. What could I do with you? Yeah. No, but I mean, what did he say about education? He well, said... Well, he said stick to the schooling. Stay to the schooling. We get somewhere, he said. I think that is so Yeah, stay unusual. to schooling, he said. So you had to graduate from high school before the, he would let you go in the mines. That's right. After you worked in the mines oh, so right. many years, how much was your pension a month? From the miners, uh -huh. thirty dollars. Thirty dollars. Thirty dollars a month. It started with two hundred some dollars. Of course, I was too young to take a pension that time, you know. But when I came to take the pension, it was down to thirty dollars. Oh my goodness! So. Because they almost went back, or they did go bankrupt. Probably. That's right. Yeah. And um, if you got hurt in the mines, right. Um, how many days did you have to be out before yeah, they gave days, you? Yeah, seven days. Seven working days. You had to be off. Seven working days. And then how much would they give you? Well, say about maybe eight dollars a month, eight dollars a week, or something like that. It was I rough. Don't, I it don't was know rough. how you would. It was that. rough. That's right. It's terrible. Al, did you like working in the mines? Who me? Well, no, I didn't like working, but I had to. I know you had yeah, to. I had to. But... I had to. So there's no place, but... no place to go, and nowhere to go. How many, did your father, was that the only job your father had working in the mines? That's right. How old was he when he died? Oh, 78. Oh, he looked yeah, pretty good. Yeah, he was 78 years old when he died. And well, Al, the, the, don't forget, he was asthma too. He had jack hammered, you know. Right. Well, Al, it has been wonderful talking to you. No. It's, I've enjoyed it so much, but, and I have learned yeah, so much yeah. from you. And I hope that we see you at all the festivities this weekend. I hope so.
Barlow's team with a time of 23.81 seconds. Jeff Price will take it for them. Thanks, Thank Jeff. You, Mark. <laughs> Second place went to the American Red Cross with a time of 23.33 seconds. I'll take it. <laughs> there you go. You can give that to Scott. Okay. There's your plaque. Thanks for coming down. Okay, folks. you want Thanks for coming, it? guys. Okay. Yeah, and first it. place with a time of 23.13 yeah. seconds, yeah, German Zone, Larry's Market. That's <laughs> nice. What? On behalf of the First Aid Centennial Committee, we'd like to present your team with the first place plaque in the bed race. Thank you very Thank much. You. And also, yeah, guys. $50. Wow. What? And uh, do what you will with it. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to donate this back and put it towards the scholarship fund that you guys are forming. Thank you very much. Okay. Mark, thank you very we'll much. We'll certainly put this guys, in our store. Thanks again for participating. Thank you. you can hang that right in the store, right at the cash register. Uh, I'll quickly go over the members of our team. Yeah, Steve Coleman, Kevin, Kevin Collins, <laughs> Mark Esbro. Yeah, my name is Mark Kiefer, the owner of Larry's Market. Okay. like you to tell them first about your job and where you worked. Uh, right. I started in Colebrook. And where, tell them where Colebrook is. Up in Carbondale. 
And uh, I worked, I started up there in, uh, I think it was in September. And uh, I got a job up in the breaker on the bull rollers. Now the bull rollers is fed by a conveyor line that comes out of the pit where they dump the mine cars. It comes up this conveyor line. It comes up, goes into a chute, and into the bull rollers. And on the side, they had cups that I used to grease. Well, and Danny, then, tell us what the bull rollers did. The bull rollers broke up that mine coal when it come in. Were See, they, they put chunks? it into the tip. And then from the tip, it went into this conveyor line. And the conveyor line took it up into a chute, into the bull rollers. Now these are the big rollers. They had very big teeth on them. And on the side, where uh, they had two grease cups, one on each side. And I used to go around, and I used to keep them up all the time. Then October, they sent me down on the platform. Now this is a totally colliery. And uh, when I went down on the platform, it was in uh, late, late October. Of what year? So, what year? Uh, 1939. And, uh, and then, after we got through with that, then they experimented with bag bagging coal. So this bag coal used to come in a boxcar. At that time, they weren't too much up on it. They were just in the experimenting right. ages. Well, let me ask you a question. Why do you think they started to bag the coal in those small bags? The cities, they used stoves, I guess. Boy. Right, so they just I needed could, the small yeah. bag of coal. No, but back home where <laughs> I lived, we had the stove upstairs, and in the cellar we had a furnace. Right. And that's where we used a lot of chestnut. Great. Now, I want to ask you something that's very important because we're celebrating first aid this right. weekend. We're celebrating the centennial. And I want you to tell us your experiences with first aid. Okay, you hold this. Okay. I studied first aid. We went to a school over in Childs. That was on the other side. And we put in a lot of hours. And these hours that I put in, what I learned from them was a capillary cut, a vein cut, and an artery cut. Now when you get a capillary cut, you don't have to worry about it too much. But you should wash it off with peroxide. And then to, to use iodine, but today we use Benadine. They taught us about the back. Your back was very, very dangerous injuries because you had this, you had the vertebrae, you had the disc, and you had the spinal cord that went up through. And if the, the, the spinal cord, if that ever got damaged, you were left really damaged, you were left paralyzed. But with a vertebrae or a disc, they could uh, take care of it. And then, it, when you break an arm, you have to tell the guy if it has a, a broken arm, you tell him to move his fingers or move his elbow or move his hip. And that determines where his pain is. And then right away you get him to the hospital. That's what we were taught in first day. Now, <clears throat> if you have a leg injury, you're going to have a broken leg, you're going to have a broken angle, ankle, you could have a broken hip, and when you check these, this person is always laying down. And the first thing, if it's into the leg, they ask them to move their fingers. Then they tell them, move their toes. And then they'll tell them to move their heads from side to side. And they'll talk to you. And then, 
from there, we, you go on to stomach injuries. Whenever they sped up blood, they have a bad stomach injury. So right away they go to the hospital. Danny, I want you to tell us about when you went up to Grumman Olson for a job. When I went up to Grumman and Olson for a job, uh, Mr. Shelley, he was the big boss up there, the plant superintendent. And uh, he says to me, he says, well, what can you do? He says, have any? I says, I, I have qualifications. And I showed him. You showed him the card. The card. And when I showed him the card, he the says. The first aid card. The first aid card. He says, well, come to work the next day. And I started there. And while I was in there, they had hired a young guy. I don't think he was in there no more than two or three days. Whatever happened to him, he cut an artery. And right away, they hollered for me. Uh, Coulter, he was by the place there right. where they were working. See, he was the, ma the machine, uh, the electrician. Right. And they kept yelling for me from the office, Danny, Danny, go to the first aid room. When I went in the first aid room and I seen her bleeding, when that times we used them old handkerchiefs that were big, I took the handkerchief, I tied a little knot, slipped it up on his red, on his uh, uh, thing here. Upper arm there. Yep, the uh, upper arm. And then I got a piece of that uh, metal and I put it in there and I turned it. It stopped bleeding. So I said to Coulter, I said, hurry on, get me up to the hospital with him. So when he was getting ready to go, as we went out, I said, just a minute, Jimmy. I let that loose, and I let maybe two, three, four pumps come out. Then I tightened it up again. He got me in the car, and then when I was in the car, we had the towel there, and I'd open that up every so often, and I'd let the blood run out. And what then, was the purpose of that? Wait a minute, I'm okay. coming to that right. now. <laughs> so anyhow, I tightened it up again. So when I took him up to the hospital, he went up there, he had no infection because I kept loosening that. But say what the nurse said to you. And the nurse says to me, who done this on him? I says, I did. He says, you've done a very good job. Well, I said, that's how we were taught in first aid with God's help, because God was with me all the time. Right. Even in the accidents that I had, right. all my hardships, right. God never forgot me. I know. German and he's been a barber for many many years he's still practicing three days a week and we're very happy to conclude our series with Danny Couture. Danny, uh, how long did you stay in the mines? I think it was about four years. I got in in 1929 of course I was a youngster when they when they had the because it was in the 1899. For the first day right. First date right. when they had the well, first date. You went date. around then. Well, I was around, but I was just a kid, right. and I always remember a siren blowing. That meant that someone in the mines they had a cave in or something. Right. Someone got hurt. By the time they get him in the hospital, he'd be dead. So that's why they started this first aid. Right. I think first aid they should have in school. It should be a, a subject. 
that you learn because it's a matter of life. It saves a life. Right. Yeah. We used to get, uh, when I was in the Army, when the war broke out, we had a doctor, and uh, we'd go in a mess hall, and he'd get a rabbit or a dog, and he'd tell you, he'd uh, put him to sleep, and then cut his veins and cut his artery. There's a big difference between veins and artery. Veins, the, uh, the blood uses artery, it heart pumps it out. Right. Six, about six hours, you're dead. And Danny, uh, you were a medic, weren't you? In yeah, the, uh, I was combat army? medic. Yeah. Uh, and also, uh, Danny, you had the distinction of having been at Pearl Harbor when Pearl Harbor was bombed. Oh, that's right, yeah. December 7th, 1941. Uh -huh. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, uh, let's see. I was downtown at the time. I was going to, I saw in a paper a, le a woman, she was a nurse on the on a aircraft carrier. She or on a ship, I guess. She was a nurse, and I was going to see her. But oh, they was, bombed. She the, was she the one from East German? Right, Daniel. Right, right. She married, uh, oh, I forget what the guy's name was. Well, he, he was, wasn't from around here. He was from California. Right. He had a daughter out there. He was married uh, before her. Right. Yeah. And you were going to visit her that day? That's right. But they bombed seven in the morning. I know. And uh, 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 a native knocked at the door and he told me that they're bombing Pearl Harbor. I says, if you don't get out of here, I'm going to bomb you. <laughs> I says, I'm going home in 21 days. <laughs> well, tell us about the mules that you had to take every day. Well, uh, yeah, I had to take two mules. I had to go over the mule, mule, mule barn, over where the Briser beef is now, a pallet. Well, let's call it the German colliery. Yeah, well, uh, I used to take them down Main Street, and then uh, uh, in the mine, I had a sh uh, mine shaft there. Uh, you could only, there's no track. You just go downhill. It was all downhill. There was a gate down there, a, fan, a gate, and I'd open that up and the mules would go by, you know, and they'd stop. They were trained. I had, in the chamber, uh, when I first saw it, I thought, I thought the coal was coming from the sky, the way the uh, coal ran uh, with the mountain, you know? And they would dynamite it and it'd come down into a chute and then they load the car. Yeah. So I thought it was coming from the sky. <laughs> the third day I worked there, we had a rope chamber where the uh, motor runner hooks onto the cable and it goes up in the, up in the chamber. And uh, what happened, I'm down the bottom and there's a curve there and I'm standing there. And I tell them to pull the sliders. They pull the sliders and never had the car hooked up. So it came down right off the corner, you know. I got a, my head burned a little bit, you know. I Did didn't, I didn't get, it didn't hit me. If it hit me, it killed me. <laughs> I was only 17 years old. Third day I worked in the mines. Move over here. Danny, um, could you tell us something about the pump house up here? Uh, it was, uh, it cost a d a million dollars. It was a million oh, dollar pump. One of the biggest one, one of the uh, biggest in the whole world. And you could walk the pipe that went in the mines to pump the water. You could walk in it. It was that big. And they'd pump it in the river. And they had three shifts down there, eight-hour shifts. Because people always had to be there. Man they worked there. The pumps. It was just as clean as your house down there. I was never down there, but uh, they used to go down there weekends. A bus would come in, and uh, there were engineers, men and women. And they'd get on this flat car, that. and they'd drop them down in there to see it, you know? Yeah. And you called that Hog Island, didn't you? Where Hog the, Island, right. Where the pump was. Yeah, Hog Island. Yeah. What, what was it raised? Was the ground raised a little bit where it was? Yeah, and, and that was cement. The entrance was made out of cement. Because the workers would go down there, you know. Uh -huh. the, their job was to work down there, see. Three shifts. There was three shifts, 24 hours a day. And um, what water did they pump? From where to where? From Forest City all the way from Forest City down here. And they picked this spot because it was the lowest. And then from from here already, it's uphill. So it doesn't seem like it would be uphill though. Yeah, it is. It is uphill, yeah. When, the, when they went out of business, the D&H, they took the pump with them. It was a million dollar pump. Right, and where did they take it? You don't know. I don't know where they took it. <laughs> and then I imagine the mines are all flooded. That's right. All you have underneath is water holding you up. So the town of German is floating on water. Right. Yeah. That's kind of scary to think yeah, about that. Yeah, it's kind of scary. <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of 
a lot of coal left there, a lot of pillars. And they didn't take them all out. They couldn't take them out because then right. they'd have caves. The whole cave town in. would go in. Right, yeah. We used to have caves up here on uh, Lincoln Street. Right. We had caves. And Jefferson Avenue, too. I was 17 years old I when know. I worked in the mine. My mother and a sister of mine went over to the D&H Breaker, and they told the boss, we have to eat, give them a job. <laughs> and that's uh. how I got the job. I worked there four years, and I was, uh, I, the reason I had six motor runners, I was an extra. If a guy didn't show up, I took his place. I well, got you it. know, people just don't realize how tough times were. Oh, you had a... Only you people know, you, yeah, you know? See, the only thing they had was the mines. Right. There was nothing else, and there was dog holes up in the mines, up in right. the mountain there. They call them dog holes. There was tell independent us, miners. Tell us how much you made when you worked at the Miller Casket that short time. How much? Twenty-five did you cents make? an hour, oh. two dollars a day. I probably ate that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Danny. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and send down your blessings on those your servants here gathered, descendants and family members of our first aid founders citizens of this fair community, dignitaries and friends, one and all, bless this gathering, this celebration, and the bounty we are about to receive from, your, from our gracious God, now and forever. Amen.
Shields, a benefactor for our region and a pioneer for the first aid movement in the world. He also chose our region in which to settle and practice his healing arts. Hasn't it been wonderful this weekend to feel the working roots of our town as it comes alive with hope and meaning and feeling once more? Roots indeed need to be nourished and recultivated, and for that replenishment once again, let us pause to be thankful for those who have preceded us. I welcome you all to our program this evening. The stories of the coal mines are the legacy of coal country. Tonight, we are going to give you a glimpse into the lives of two such boys who might have been your grandfather or great-grandfather. My name is Danny Evans and I'm nine years old. I work over at that colliery across the river. I'm a breaker boy. That means I pick out the rock from the pieces of coal as they come down the chute. I started about six months ago. Pa said I had to help out because Ma died a little while ago and things are pretty tough at home. There are four young ones behind me and only Will and Annie ahead of me. That's Will over there. He's a laborer in the mines. We live in this town called German. Nearly everyone here works at the German colliery. I bring home about $4.20 a week. Pa says this sure helps out. We have a cow, chickens, and a big garden but it's still hard making it in this house. Pa feels bad about me quitting school and everything, but what can you do? The work isn't so bad. In the beginning, my fingers used to bleed all the time, but Annie would rub goose grease into them, and now they are pretty tough. At first, I couldn't get used to the noise of the machines, the coal never stops coming, and it makes me deaf to hear it. We go to work at 7 in the morning and finish about 6.30 at night. I try to keep going as fast as I can because the boss sometimes stomps on our fingers with his hobnail boots. We boys have a sign language we use to slip in a few words once in a while. We try and sneak our lunch while we're working so we can use our lunch time to play games outside the breaker. I hate working in the winter. It's dark when we go in and dark when we come home. Summers are so good. I can hear the birds singing as I walk to work. And that makes me feel happy. And when we finish for the day, everyone is standing outside and they all say something to me and that's real nice. Sunday's the best day of all. 
After church, Annie dishes up a big dinner, and then we have the whole rest of the day to do whatever we want. There goes the whistle. Got to get back to work. See ya. Herman. I started as a breaker boy, but I couldn't wait to get down to the mine. When I was 11, I, ca I became a nipper. That means I was making 80 cents an hour. My job was to sit next to a big door which stretches across the gangway. When I, could, when I would hear the cars coming, I would open the door fast. Empty cars would go into the chamber, full cars come out. The door is kept closed to circulate air into the mines. I was alone all day in the dark, except for the car by lamp. Sure was lonely down there. You never see anybody. The worst was falling asleep, then all kinds of things can happen. Lots of rats were down in there with me, and I would play with them to uh, make the time go by. The miners say that it's bad luck to kill a rat because they warn us when a cave is happening. The mine is always settling. It groans and creaks and drips all the time. I don't want to think that I'm a mile below the ground because then I wouldn't want to go down there. Now I'm a laborer. I work in a space with a miner. I'm called a buddy or a helper. Each day we have to carry our tools in because we don't know where we're going to be working. The miner checks for poison gas, and if the roof is low, we knock down that part and sometimes hammer new timber in place. Then we start the real work. One of my jobs is to load the coal on the cars. Each car holds four to five tons. I like the freedom we have in the chambers because the foreman only comes once a week. My, my pa is a miner. I wanted to work with him, but the company won't let family members work together. In case of an accident, two could be gone. Pa says that maybe in a few years I can get my mining certificate. I think I will always be in the mines. There's not much other work to do around here, and all my friends work here. We have a good pa. Uh, he has had to take care of us kids a while now. Annie does all the house stuff. Her and the little ones earn a little money picking coal on the uh, column dump and selling for 10 cents a bag. We all try to help Pop. When I come out of work at the end of the day, I look up at the mountains and they make me feel clean again. <laughs> to be under very oppressive um, company owners and there was a secret society built in, 18, in the 1850s called the Molly Maguires, which responded to the oppressive company owners with, at times, a terrorist um, reaction toward the minor owner. The song is called The Ghost of Molly Maguire. <clears throat> well, I'll tell you, boys, Patty Kelly is my name, and I come from Calvin County. I killed the boss of the Langford Mine. Now my soul is up for bounty, but I will die with my head held high, cause I fought for the men below. A candle will be lit in the memory of each one of these miners who dedicated their lives to helping others and to giving us a place here in German, a place in American history. At this time, let us bow our heads for a moment of silent prayer. Mayor Button, on behalf of my wife, myself, and all of my colleagues in the Pennsylvania State House, congratulations to you, the borough's chief executive, the entire Shields family, and all the people who live in Germany on your current celebration. As the chief executive, I'd like to present to you this framed copy of the citation, as well as House Resolution 215 as a memento of the time. And if you haven't already seen it, this is what it looks like. <laughs> One more pleasurable task, and that is to present to Mr. George Rose and Mrs. Margaret Tiso proclamations also from the Pennsylvania State House signed by the Speaker of our House, the Honorable Matthew J. Ryan, which will simply attest to what I have said in reference to House Resolution 250. Mr. Rose. Margaret, 
ขึ้นขึ้นมาเลยNow come to that part of the program when we're going to hear from the grandson, Dr. Matthew Shields. George Rose is now going to speak to us. Mr. Rose. Well, I want to do something a little different. I'd like to try to paint a word picture for you. You're a new young physician that just arrived in town. Someone knocks on your door. You open the door, and there stands a miner, covered with coal dust, and he says, Doc, come quick. Somebody's been hurt. So you grab your satchel, and you run up the straggle on Pave Street, along with half of the townspeople. You cross over to the bridge, and upon arriving at the mine, you had to push your way through women and children. Once there, you find a man on a dirty board, and you look at him, and he's got a wad of chewing tobacco stuck in a hole in his arm, and a dirty miner's undershirt wrapped around another arm, and there's dried blood on the man. You remove the filthy rags, and you want my heaven, what is this? Thus, Dr. Matthew Shields was exposed to the medical practices of the coal mines of the 1890s. Something ought to be done with the miners themselves. They should be taught something, somehow, what to do before the doctor comes. But how? Strangely, in some instances, he tried to convince some miners that he could teach them some basic rudiments or what to do, and they could help the miner before he got there. And this was met with some indifference. And some of the information I've dug up, I'll go when the time comes, till the word, tis the word of God, he was, several of the miners said. He tried to convince the mine foreman to set up a medical station, that he would train the miners. Too expensive. The bosses want miners, not doctors. He found out that some of his patients were Cousin Jack miners from Cornwall, India, uh, England, so-called pitmen. And there was a fund that had been founded so many years before to help the injured miner, and it was called the Cake Fund. This, he thought, well, this would be a good place to try to speak to that group. Also, some of these English miners were, had some training in the St. John's Ambulance Corps in England, which was founded in the 1870s and they were calling it impromptu work. He thought, gee, this is a good idea, maybe I can get with them. Therefore, on October 25th, 1899, with a group of 24 miners, and Dr. Shields is their instructor, they met at Old Carpenter's Hall at the Farmer's Hotel in German. Thus, the first ever first aid class began, and it was the start of first aid training in the United States. In the beginning, bandages were made with linen from the miners' homes, splints were from the cholera, and Dr. Shields brought his office skeleton. One time he brought a, he brought a beef heart, which I imagine was a good sight, heart, and he proceeded to cut it open. Promptly one of the miners passed out. So he showed them how to bring somebody out who had sainted. There is a story about a clinic that was being given at the Pottsville Hospital by one of the county's, country's most celebrated surgeons to the members of the Schuylkill County Medical Society. During the lecture, an injury case came in from the Silver Creek Colliery. The assembled doctors were invited to the receiving ward to examine the dressings. The first aid men were asked to explain about the injury and their dressing as the case involved a bone fracture and lacerations plus an eight mile trip to the mine, or to the hospital, excuse me. The distinguished surgeon told the doctors that dressing should not be touched until photographed as it is very professional to have been done by laymen. Later meetings of this medical society 
indicated that cases coming to them were in far better condition than ever before because of first aid treatment in the mine. During Dr. Shield's lifetime up until he died in 39, 1939, the Red Cross issued over 2 million first aid certificates. Over the next 10 years, he continued to travel the United States lecturing and teaching. Ladies and gentlemen, from that humble beginning, first aid became a way of life for millions of we Americans. And many more millions of persons have been saved from death and permanent injury by the crusade he launched here in German 100 years ago. I am sure those same millions never heard of the name Matthew Shield or any other member of that first aid class, but they have affected their lives in some manner. I'd like to leave you with a tribute made to him at a Red Cross national meeting many years ago. Few men are so gifted that they cast a protective shadow over the lives of so many. Few men are so dedicated that they devote those rare talents to the preservation of humanity. Few men are so honored as to leave behind a magnificent monument of life from which all mankind can profit. Such a man was Dr. Matthew Shields, Father First Aid in the United States. Thank you. Said it's time for bed. I'm glad we were wed. Side by side. And she unscrewed her arm from the socket. <laughs> She put her false teeth in her pocket. Her wig all so fair, she hung on the chair. Side by side. Then she took her cork leg, she put it over the chair. And when she took out her dainty glass eye, it was more than I could bear. Broken hearted, most of my wife had departed. I slept on the chair, there was more of her there. German is not only the birthplace of first aid, but German is the birthplace of healing, the heartbeat of the anthracite coal region is our borough. And your presence makes the heart continue beating. O oh Lord, we thank you that you have nourished us, we thank you, and we bless your holy name.